Hello, welcome to God Day. I'm Derek Walker, the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. I want to share a story from the Old Testament today that I believe will be a great motivation for us. Uh, I call it the March of Faith. And uh, we're going into 2 Kings chapter 2, just to set the scene. 2 Kings chapter 6, sorry, verse 24 and 25. It happened after this that Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his army, went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver. That's a lot of money. And one-fourth of a cab, or a dollop, in other words, of dove droppings, were for five shekels of silver. Now that's inflation. So in other words, there's such a great famine now that, that people were absolutely desperate for food. That's how bad it was. And the cause, what caused this, this famine, what caused this siege was, was Israel's sin. They were, they, they'd been warned, you know. Moses warned them that if, you're, if they will continue in sin, they will be oppressed by their enemies and they will go into great famine. You can read about that in Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. And so what was really needed was repentance. You know, if we go away from God, we will experience a spiritual famine. And uh, the, the word of God will mean nothing to us. And we will suffer and we will not, although we're chasing happiness, we won't find it. And, uh, and it's not God's fault when that happens. It's because we've turned away from God. But um, <clears throat> we, we want to, as we read on, we see that the king who... Uh, is not a, a very good king, but uh, it says he had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, he is the king, called Jehoram actually, the son of Ahab. Uh, he wasn't as bad as Ahab, but he, but he wasn't really a good king at all. Uh, so we read about the king now in verse 26, and things have got so bad that he is actually repenting a bit. It says, then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, help my Lord, O King. And he said, if the Lord does not help you. Um, and it's interesting that the King, you know, it, it's not total repentance, but there is repentance there. And that's the reason why God actually moves in this story. There is some repentance from God's people. And the King is now looking to the Lord. Notice, he says, if the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? So, you know, oftentimes repentance begins when we realize we can't save ourselves. We can't help ourselves. And then we begin to look to God. When we come to the end of ourselves, we begin to look to God and realize he's the only one that can help us. And that's where this king has got to. And he says, from the threshing floor or from the wine press. In other words, he's saying, look at our supplies. How can I help you? We, we, we have no resources. And we need to realize we cannot save ourselves. We, we have no resources in ourselves. In fact, the Bible, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You, you have to come to the end of yourself. You have to realize you're poor in yourself. And then you're going to depend on God in your life. And then the king said to her, what is troubling you? And so again, it's quite touching that the king, in this crisis, for all his faults, he is concerned for this woman. It shows that God has been working in his heart. And she answered, this woman said to me, give, me, give your son that we may eat him today. Sorry, this is very gross. And we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. Uh, but actually, that isn't what upset her. And... Uh, What's, what upset her is what's coming next. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. And so, uh, you know, this is, this is just great, terrible. This tells you how bad the situation has got. And when the king heard this, it was, it was too much even for this rather evil king. Uh, it says, verse 30, now it happened that when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes. And as he passed by on the wall, the people looked and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. And, and sackcloth again is what you would wear when you are mourning, when you're repenting for your sin. So the king was repenting. All right, he wasn't perfect, but he was repenting. He, he, was, he was turning to God as best he could in this situation. And, 
when he tore these clothes, that was another sign of his sorrow and his repentance of the mess that he had got into and his kingdom had got into. Sackcloth was very uncomfortable. And, and so it was a used as a sign before God of someone who's repentant and sorry for their sin. And um, Elisha was God's prophet. He was God's man. And no, no doubt Elisha would have been preaching, you know, you, you've broken God's law. Um, but if you repent, God will save you. So the king is responding to that. But we're going to see that his repentance is, is somewhat superficial. Let's go into chapter 6, verse 31 now. And then the king has a flash of anger. Now he starts to blame God's prophet. He says, then the king said, God do so to me, and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. So he's angry at the prophet now. He says, oh, I've, I've been repenting and nothing's happened. We're, we're still in this mess. I'm going to kill Elisha. So that's going to solve his problems, isn't it? So that we kind of see that the king is a bit double, double-minded in his repentance. Um, but, but obviously, Elisha had promised deliverance, and it looked like the deliverance hadn't come. Verse 32, it says, Then Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him, and the king sent a man ahead of him. And, and as we read the story, it's clear that the king had actually sent a man to kill Elisha. He was following through on his prophet, promise. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, this is Elisha now speaking to the elders, do you see how this son of a murderer, the son of Ahab, has sent someone to take away my head? And, they, and Elisha had a word of knowledge. Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And it seems that uh, the king was actually running. He had second thoughts. He was running to try and stop the, the assassin. So you see the kind of double-mindedness going on here. So Elisha delayed the soldier, you see, until the king could catch up and cancel the order. And then it says, and while he was still talking with them, the messenger came down to him, and then the king arrived and said, surely this calamity is from the Lord. So now he's acknowledging that it's their sin that had brought this judgment upon them. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? He says, when is God going to turn this around for us? We, are, we have acknowledged our sin. And um, then we move into chapter 7, and Elisha gives a stunning prophecy of deliverance. He says, then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord, thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, uh, and that's, that's not very much. And two measures of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. In other words, even just tomorrow, it seemed impossible, but tomorrow there'll be plenty of food for everybody. One, amazing. And uh, he was declaring the promise that God had heard their prayers. He'd heard their repentance, such as it was, and he, God was going to turn it around. And that gave them the hope and the faith now to arise and to take action, to, to, to turn the situation around. And so God was declaring the victory. Uh, and now, but it was still up to God's people to believe it in their heart and, and to respond. But there was an unbeliever present, um, and, and, and he did not accept it. Verse 2, it says, So an officer on whose hand the king leaned, his main advisor perhaps, answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? In other words, Elisha's just hallucinating out of, uh, out of hunger. This is impossible. You know, even if the Syrians left, our food supply is gone. It, it's going to take weeks and months to recover the food. So this is, this is total nonsense. You know, sometimes when God speaks his promise to you, it, it just doesn't make any sense to your head. And, and you say, that is impossible. And yet when God speaks, he expects you to believe him. He, he knows best. And uh, this unbeliever paid the price for his unbelief. Because as we all see, he will be shut out of the blessing of God. Because when God makes a promise, you have to believe it and receive it if it's to come to pass in your life. So notice, Elisha said, 
In fact, you will see it with your eyes. You'll see this, but you will not eat of it. We'll see later in the story how, what, how that happened. He said, you will not partake of that blessing, even though it's going to come to pass. Well, how did this deliverance come about? What happened next? And I particularly want to point out that God still needs faith from his people to bring it to pass. Elisha had given the prophecy and that message of Elisha's prophecy through the elders would have gone around the whole city. Now the whole city would have heard, would have been in their papers as it were that day. Elisha promises deliverance tomorrow. And so there was a hope, an expectation, although the circumstances looked hopeless. You know, when Elisha spoke, he was the man of God. They, they, they would have, that news would have got out. And uh, we're going to see that there was some four people who were instrumental in the deliverance that God used because they were the four people who actually believed the word and acted on the word. And God used them to bring the deliverance to pass. And here we meet them now, the most unlikely four people, the weakest four people that you could imagine. Verse 3, 2 Kings 7, 3, it says, Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. They were lepers, so they couldn't live among the rest, but they still heard the, the news. And they said to, to another, Why are we sitting here till we die? I love that. They, 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 they were used to sitting there as outcasts. They were in passivity. They, there was nothing they could do. They had to depend on other people bringing them food. And of course, that has, has, has gone out. Um, they could just stay passive and do nothing. But something rises up in their heart. And I believe it was when they heard Elisha's prophecy. They heard the word of God. They heard God say, God's going to turn this around. God is with you again. He's going to help you. And something stirred in their hearts to say, we must respond. We must take action. And God uses their response. Even though it seems, what, how can God possibly use four lepers? But they acted on the word that Elisha gave. They decided that doing nothing was not an option. And they arose. And by faith, they marched on the enemy camp. And uh, it's, it was, uh, they did a march of faith. Um, it, they basically, it says, that they started to walk toward the Syrian camp. They thought, well, what else can we do? And um, they, they are a picture of, of, of when we act on the word of God. You know, it's not enough to hear the word of God we must act on the word of God. They, they believed the word and they said to one another, why do we sit here till we die? I, I love that. In other words, see what the word of God does first of all is it, it strengthens our heart. It causes us to rise up on the inside. It gives us hope. And then we're meant to act on the word of God, to take action as, as we are able to. Um, and as we take the action, that releases the power of God. They were in passivity, but now they're thinking, why do we just stay here, sitting in our doubts till we die? Why are we sitting in our depression till we die? Why do we just sit in our fear and worry till we die? Why do I just sit under my circumstances, under enemy de denomination, just weighed down by the setbacks of my life? And freedom begins by asking that question. Why should I just sit here till I die? Why don't I do something with my life? Um, and, and we should be actors, not reactors. We should not be victims, but victors. How can we do that? By take, getting the word of God in our heart and then acting on it, acting as if it's true. And then we will find the power of God working with us. Praise God. Are we paralyzed by the past? Are we fearful of the future? Are we quitting on life? Are we s settling for passivity? Are we accepting defeat as normal? Are we just letting life happen to us? Do we sit and sink? Or we do, we, do we get back on our feet and off the substitutes back bench and back into the game? They didn't have uh, much, many options to them. 
but uh, they took the action that they could take. And it says, they, they discuss among themselves, you see. If we say, we will enter the city, the famine is in the city. So it's pointless us going into the city. There's no food there. We will die there. And if we sit here, we die also. So the only option open to us, he says, therefore, come, let us fall upon the army of the Syrians. Let's go to the Syrian army. That took a lot of courage to walk straight against the enemy. That's an awesome courage. But what fortified them in that was the knowledge that Elisha's prophecy said that there will be a great victory against the enemy. And so it looked impossible, but they said, let us, let us go out to the enemy camp. If they keep us alive, we'll live. And if they kill us, we'll only die. In other words, they're saying, we don't know what's going to happen. It seems a crazy thing to do, but um, we're going to go in faith and we'll just see how God works. What have we got to lose? You know, often we, 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 we convince ourselves not to do anything because something might go wrong. And, 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 and really, if God says, I'm with you, then we take action. We don't know how it's going to work out, but we have the courage because God promises that he's going to be with us. And as we go, God's power is released through us. And so these, these lepers rise up in their heart, and they're the only ones, but they're the ones that God uses. They have great courage to do this, by the way, because, again, they might expect to be killed by the Syrians. But, again, they had the attitude, what have I got to lose? If I just waste my whole life, you know, even if I, I go out and take action and do this thing that God's put on my heart, even if I fall on my face, well, that's still better than just sitting here and not trying. That was their attitude. And so we need to say, like the, like the lepers, I'm going to walk out of this worry. I'm going to march out of my old ways. I'm going to take hold of that life that God's word promises I can have. I'm not going to waste my life. Jesus has set me free, so I'm going to march my march of faith into the promised land. And that's what the lepers did. And I want you to notice what they did. Verse 5. 2 Kings 7, 5, they rose up. I love that. They rose up. Here are these four lepers. We can identify with them. We feel so weak sometimes. Like, what can I do? But it says, they rose up. Notice the timing at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, there was no one there. Notice they arise, they arose at twilight when things turn gray. It's not the best time. You know, things are getting about dark. Maybe they should wait for the morning. But no, when faith is stirred in your heart, that's the time to act. Now is the acceptable time. And so I will arise and I will walk out of this cage, out of this prison in the name of Jesus. And um, we walk by faith, not by sight, like these lepers. And it wasn't very easy. You can imagine the sight of these four lepers. This is God's victorious army. <laughs> they had to help each other to their feet. Every step was an agony. Only the faith in their heart kept them going. They were hungry, but they marched on. They were sick and in pain, but they marched on. They were alone in the night, but they marched on. Dangerous, heading into perhaps death, but they marched on. This was Israel's army limping along, but actually... Little, perhaps they didn't realize it, but they were being mighty in God because they were acting in faith. They were stirred by Elisha's prophecy. It had given them hope. And they were actually God's invading army, as we're going to see. And so when they arrive at the camp, for some reason, the Syrians had already fled. And this is the explanation in verse 6. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of the chariots and the noise of horses the noise of a great army. And so they said to one another, Lord, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians and to attack us, and therefore they rose and fled at twilight. Do you see the connection? The Syrians had heard the sound of an enormous army. And so they fled in panic. And when did they flee? At twilight. When did the lepers start their march on the Syrians at twilight. When did they, the Syrians hear the sound of a mighty army? At twilight. 
Do you see the connection? Exactly when the lepers marched their march of faith, it wasn't the Hittites, of course, it was God's army, his angelic army, uh, marched with them. So as the lepers marched in faith, the armies of God marched with them. In a previous episode, Elisha had asked God to open the eyes of his servant to see the armies of the Lord, and, and his eyes were open. They saw the great armies, and now that very same angelic army is marching with these four lepers. See, when you march your march of faith, when you get up out of your passivity and said, God spoke, and I'm going to do what God tells me, even if I fall on my face, then God marches with you. God's power is released as you march your march of faith. Praise God. And so as they did, and these lepers were the key to victory, they were the ones who acted on the word of God that Elisha gave. And as they acted on the word of God, the power of God was released. The armies of God went and caused the Syrian army to flee in panic. And guess what? They left all the food behind. And that's why there was such an abundance of food right, right ready. But when you march your march of faith, you won't be alone because God's invisible army is going to march with you. And the enemy will have no choice but arise and flee. And when they arrived at the enemy camp expecting to, to meet hostility, the enemy had fled in fear. And when God goes with you, he removes the enemy before you and he gives you the victory. And the, you can often walk in a situation that you think is hard, but you'll find that God's already dealt with it and you will enjoy the victory. But you had to have the courage to take that step of faith. Only when they marched at twilight did heaven march with them. What if they wouldn't have done their march? Then nothing would have happened. And so this is a great example to us. These lepers were vital to the outcome. And it's that key about the twilight that actually gives the key to this whole, what, what happened. God needed their faith, their faith put into action to release his power, to give the victory, to fulfill the promise that Elisha gave from God. All God needed really was their response for these men to make their march of faith. The rest of the city stayed in passivity, waiting to see if Elisha's word would come to pass. But these men were stirred in their hearts and they took action and God honored that, their faith. And so acting on our faith, we each have to do our march of faith. The four lepers, they just had one word from God and when they marched on it, God did great things. We have the whole word of God. We have so many promises that we can embrace and march on. Take hold of a promise of God. Maybe the promise that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. Now, march on that verse. Say, yes, that verse is true. I'm going to rise up, and I'm going to live like that verse is true. And I'm going to do that thing that I've been afraid to do. And then it says, when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent, ate and drank, and carried from it silver, gold, and clothing, and went and hid it. Then they came back and entered another tent, and carried some from there also, and went and hid it. So they were, they were enjoying the spoils of victory, and fair enough. They were the ones who, as it were, had won the victory by their faith. They, were, they had the right to the first spoils. Um, but then they said to one another, and this is also an important message, we are not doing right. This day is a good day of good news. That's the gospel. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, um, some punishment will come on us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. See, once you have done uh, your march of faith, you know, and I just want to thank God for Jesus, of course, because he came to earth and he did his march of faith on his own, and he went all the way through to the cross, and he won our salvation. Praise God. But he could have enjoyed all the spores from himself, but he wanted to share it with us all. Praise God. But also when we have, have come into the blessing of God, when we have discovered the good news of Jesus Christ, when we've come and partook uh, 
of his salvation. We are not just meant to take it all to ourselves. We're to be like these four lepers. They've been greatly blessed. They'd enjoyed a great victory, but now they realize we must tell others. It's, it's not enough that we enjoy the blessing. We need to tell the good news to others. And that's what it is for us. Once we've accepted salvation, we need now, like those lepers, to go and tell the good news as soon as possible to other people so they can come out of their spiritual famine and enjoy the fullness of God. So let's be like these lepers because it says they went and they told the king's household. So they went and called to the gate keepers of the city and told them, saying, we went to the Syrian camp and surprisingly no one was there, not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and the tents intact. The gatekeepers called out and they told it to the king's household inside. Now the king arose in the night and said to his servants, let me tell, now tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we're hungry. Therefore, they've gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they've come out of the, the city, we shall catch them alive and get in the city. See the unbelief of the king. He had Elisha's prophecy that great victory was going to happen, but he still thinks it's a trap. You see, that's his unbelief. But then they they have a sensible, they said, let's just send a few people, check out the story. And of course, when they checked out the story, they saw that that the Syrians indeed had fled in terror. And then they all could, um, verse 16, it says, they all plundered the tents of the Syrian. And so a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel. According to the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord was fulfilled. And then the story tells about that king's officer who who laughed at Elisha's prophecy. And what it says is that he was in charge of the gate. He was in charge of the traffic and he got trampled down. So just like the prophecy said, he saw the prophecy fulfilled, but he got trampled in the, in the, in the rush to get this food. And so because of his own unbelief, he was unable to enjoy the blessing of God. And so are you ready to march your march of faith? I do you accept the word of God? Does it light a fire in your heart? Then the next thing is...